It's April 1993, and Salvatore Sammy Bull Gravano, former underboss of the Gambino crime family, is testifying at a federal district court in Manhattan. During the cross-examination, he's asked a question that everyone had been wondering about. Was it really an offense to deal drugs in the mafia? He not only replies that it was, he also asserts that it was something that could get a Gambino family member killed. For an organization that really cared about profit, it was puzzling to everyone listening that the mafia was against dealing in probably the most profitable illegal venture in the States. But there there's actually a reason why the Mafia didn't deal or distribute drugs. Several reasons, actually. And to be honest, some of them make it look like these guys have a heart. So let's dive in. The Mafia you may have a vague idea about the Mafia, but I'd like to begin by setting straight any assumptions. The Mafia is a well-structured group of Italian-Americans involved in criminal activities. It also takes its name from the original Mafia, also known as the Cosa Nostra, which originated in Sicily. Back in the day, when Italian immigrants started arriving in the United States, they brought with them their ties to the Sicilian Mafia. However, as time went on, they began to develop their own identity, separate from its Sicilian roots, evolving and transforming into a distinct entity. As this transfer transformation took place, the American Mafia expanded its reach. It didn't just stick to Sicilian immigrants anymore. It started to encompass and absorb other Italian immigrants, Italian-American gangsters, and crime groups across the United States and Canada. For example, the American Mafia welcomed members from the American Camorra, which was another Italian criminal organization operating in the United States. It sought to bring together and unite Italian criminals and crime groups who shared a common heritage, regardless of their specific regional origins within Italy. The the Mafia's primal rise in America was facilitated by several factors. The close-knit nature of Italian immigrant communities allowed for the preservation of traditional Sicilian and Italian values, including loyalty to the family, and a code of silence known as Omerta. This code of silence made it difficult for law enforcement to gather evidence and prosecute Mafia members. He didn't care who wronged him, who did this, who broke him as captain. I made that oath and I'm not going to betray my oath. That's what Omerta is. You took the blood oath. You agreed to keep your mouth shut. You knew you weren't entering uh, fantasy land. It was a criminal life. It was the moral code of utmost silence at the core, even at the face of death. Perhaps loyalty wasn't enough for the snitches who collaborated with the feds. Gradually, they took root in American cities in significant Italian populations, such as New York City, Chicago, New Orleans, and Detroit. In these cities, the Mafia established criminal networks, exerted influence over local businesses, and became involved in various illegal activities to generate wealth and power. You cannot mention the Italian-American Mafia without mentioning the five families who ruled the Prohibition period and ultimately became the symbol of an active Mafia presence in America. They were the Bonanno, Colombo, Gambino, Genovese, and Lucchese families, and they each ran their territories independently. However, they were watched over by the commission created by Lucky Luciano, which had bosses from these families and also from the Buffalo and Chicago mobs. The commission hasn't had an official meeting in a long time, but people say it might still be around. However, their emergence can be traced back to the Castella Marais War, when a power struggle within the Mafia during the early 1930s resulted in the death of numerous mobsters, including high-ranking members like Salvatore Maranzano, former boss of the Bonanno crime family. Paradoxically, the Mafia experienced a surge in influence and profits during the Prohibition era. The ban on alcohol provided organized crime groups, including the Mafia, with a lucrative opportunity to control the illegal alcohol trade. This enabled them to expand their criminal enterprises to include activities such as prostitution, gambling, loan sharking, racketeering, and various heists, but they weren't the only ones seeking to capitalize on the lucrative opportunities presented by Prohibition. In fact, collaboration and alliances among various criminal organizations were common during this time, driven by their shared goal of reaping the profits from the illicit alcohol trade. One notable example of these partnerships involved the Jewish criminal syndicate known as the Purple Gang, based in the city of Detroit. Recognizing the need for strong distribution networks and protection, the Purple Gang forged alliances with the Mafia. Together, they established a formidable presence in the bootlegging trade, ensuring a steady supply of alcohol to speakeasies and other establishments. These collaborations brought together different factions of criminals, creating intricate networks that spanned across cities and regions. Although occasional conflicts and rivalries arose, the mutual interest in the profitable alcohol trade served as a cohesive force, ensuring the continuity of these collaborations. However, the end of Prohibition in 1933 marked a turning point for the Mafia, no longer limited to bootlegging 
bootlegging, they expanded their criminal activities into a wide range of underworld enterprises, from illegal gambling to loan sharking, from prostitution rings to labor union infiltration. The mafia sought to maximize their profits by diversifying their operations. They also extended their influence to legitimate businesses, such as construction, garbage collection, trucking, restaurants, nightclubs, and even the New York garment industry. Through a combination of kickbacks and protection shakedowns, the mafia amassed enormous wealth. The mafia's success was further aided by their ability to corrupt public officials, business leaders, witnesses, and even members of the legal system. By bribing key individuals, they ensured that law enforcement and the judicial system turned a blind eye to their activities. This allowed the mafia to operate with relative impunity and maintain their dominance over organized crime. By the mid-20th century, the mafia had grown into a formidable force, with 24 known crime families in America. These families boasted an estimated 5,000 members, along many thousands of associates spread across the country. However, their influence and power were not immediately recognized by government leaders and law enforcement agencies. In fact, prior to the 1960s, there was skepticism among some government officials, including FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, regarding the existence of a national Italian-American organized crime network. They believed that criminal activities were limited to local gangs and dismissed the idea of a larger, coordinated effort by the mafia. As a result, law enforcement agencies made little progress in curbing the mafia's rise during this period. The tide began to turn in 1970 with the passage of the Racketeer-Influenced and Corrupt Organizations, or RICO Act, by Congress. This landmark legislation became a powerful tool in the government's fight against the mafia. It enabled prosecutors to target entire crime families and their revenue streams, whether legal or illegal. RICO proved instrumental in dismantling the mafia's infrastructure and convicting high-level mobsters during the 1980s and 1990s. As a response to the increased legal scrutiny, mafia bosses like Paul Castellano and Carlo Gambino strictly prohibited their members from involvement in narcotics. Individuals like Vincent the Chin Gigante were famous for killing off defaulters. The bosses were not motivated by moral opposition to drug dealing, but rather by the realization that narcotics would expose their organizations to significant legal risks. The federal government had escalated its war on drugs in the early 1970s, making it a dangerous venture for the mafia bosses, who already had more wealth than they could count. However, despite the efforts to curb their influence, some mafia bosses managed to evade prosecution and gain notoriety. One such figure was John Gotti, who emerged as the leader of the Gambino crime family following the assassination of Paul Castellano in 1985. Gotti earned the moniker Teflon Don because criminal charges against him never seemed to stick. He skillfully outmaneuvered the criminal justice system and consistently avoided conviction. Gotti's ability to evade prosecution was not an isolated case. Even his predecessor, Carlo Gambino, who led the family from 1957 to 1976, managed to increase the family's profits while successfully navigating every criminal charge brought against him. The secret to their success lay in the unwavering loyalty and code of silence maintained by the mafia. The wise guys never betrayed each other, and when someone committed a crime, a network of individuals provided airtight alibis. They would swear in court that the accused was with them, engaging in innocuous activities like playing pool, rather than being at the scene of the crime. As long as everyone stuck to the same story, it became extremely challenging to secure convictions. Furthermore, the true power and authority of the mafia bosses, the Dons, were carefully shielded. The top leaders remained well insulated from direct involvement in criminal activities activities. They never gave direct orders, but rather passed them down through a chain of intermediaries. Each level of the hierarchy was willing to lie or remain silent to protect the man in charge. This intricate system of authority and protection made it exceedingly difficult for law enforcement to penetrate the upper echelons of the mafia and secure convictions against the godfathers themselves. However, the introduction of the RICO Act was a turning point. It empowered law enforcement agencies by enabling them to absolutely prosecute entire organizations in engaged in corrupt activities. Under RICO, individuals did not necessarily have to have direct ties to organized crime, but their conduct had to be linked to such criminal activities. This broader scope allowed law enforcement to target the entire infrastructure of criminal enterprises, making it harder for the mafia to operate with impunity. It was no longer just about targeting individual mobsters. It was about dismantling the entire mafia.
the cost of doing business. Now, the mafia bosses were well aware of the severe legal repercussions that came with engaging in drug trafficking. They understood that federal authorities, such as the FBI and U.S. attorneys, had a much stronger reach and resources than local police departments. The mafias had built a network of corruption and influence at the local level, allowing them to bribe police officers and maintain a certain level of protection. However, federal law enforcement agencies operated on a different scale, making it much more difficult to escape their grasp. While the mafias were masters of evading the law and and manipulating the criminal justice system, RICO presented a formidable challenge. Breaking federal laws, especially those related to drug trafficking, would expose the bosses to a whole new level of trouble. The penalties for drug-related offenses were severe, and convictions could lead to long prison sentences and substantial fines. Under RICO, if a mafia boss was found guilty of racketeering charges, they could face up to 20 years in prison and substantial fines. Furthermore, RICO cases often involved multiple charges, meaning that a loss in court could result in even longer prison sentences. The bosses understood that fighting RICO charges required a strong and well-prepared defense, as the consequences of a conviction went far beyond imprisonment. A loss in a civil lawsuit following a criminal trial could result in triple the damages claimed, leading to significant financial consequences. One notable case that highlighted the effectiveness of RICO and the dangers it posed to the Mafia was the investigation and conviction of members of the Bonanno crew, as detailed in the story of Joseph Pistone, also known Known as Donnie Brasco. Pistone, an FBI agent working undercover, had infiltrated the crew and rose to a high rank within the organization. This infiltration led to the exposure of the crew's criminal activities, resulting in RICO charges being brought against them. In 1981, the crew's captain was prepared to propose him for formal induction into the organization, known as being a made guy. This status bestowed significant responsibilities and protections within the mob, including immunity from unauthorized killings. The trial and subsequent conviction of Sonny Black and Left Ruggiero, two prominent members of the Bonanno crew, sent shockwaves through the criminal underworld. The fact that an FBI agent had infiltrated their ranks and provided crucial evidence against them demonstrated the vulnerability of the Mafia to infiltration and betrayal. Sonny Black's disappearance before the trial and his subsequent murder highlighted the severe consequences of breaking the Code of Silence, known as the Omerta. As mentioned earlier, law enforcement authorities had struggled for nearly a century to penetrate the secretive world of the American Mafia and gather insider information about their involvement in drugs. The mobsters remained fiercely loyal to their code of silence, making it nearly impossible for the police to gain access to their inner workings. Cosa Nostra, mafia in this country during my time, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, we were not major drug pushers. We weren't a cartel, we didn't get involved. Carlo Gambino hated the idea of drugs. Persico hated drugs. Colombo hated drugs. However, faced with long prison sentences, they broke the once sacred code of Omerta and testified against their fellow mobsters in exchange for a place in the Federal Witness Protection Program. One such example is Sammy the Bull Gravano, a former mobster who eventually became a government witness. In 1993, Gravano testified against John Gotti, emphasizing the anti-drug stance followed by their group during the actual trials. The idea that Gotti's own underboss would testify against him, under oath, in open court, sent shockwaves through mob circles. Lawyers didn't believe it, mobsters didn't believe it, but it's true. However, there were some who actually engaged in the trade. In 1963, everything changed with the historic betrayal of Joseph Valachi, a former member of the Genovese crime family. He would actually be the first Mafian to break the Omerta. His testimony of the Mafia was like the volcanic eruption of an overdue bubbling. Since he had a long association with the Mafia, having joined its ranks at a young age and rising through the ranks, he became a trusted soldier under the leadership of Vito Genovese, a powerful mob boss. However, in 1959, both Valachi and Genovese were convicted for their involvement in narcotics trafficking, a supposedly banned trade that was increasingly embraced by the Mafia during that era. Now it may be hard to prove that the Mafias were not allowed to do drugs, but it didn't stop members and even top bosses from dealing drugs. The conviction occurred after the notorious Appalachian meeting, which exposed the presence of organized crime figures and attracted significant attention from law enforcement. While serving his sentence, Valachi began to feel betrayed by the Mafia and its leadership 
He grew disillusioned and feared for his life. Facing the possibility of spending the rest of his days behind bars, Valachi made the decision to break the code of silence and cooperate with law enforcement. He became the first high-ranking member of the American Mafia to provide an insider's account of its operations, hierarchy, and criminal activities. Valachi's testimony, given during the 1963 Senate investigation on organized crime, exposed the inner workings of the Mafia, including its structure, initiation rituals, and inter-gang rivalries. This made other Mafia families extremely cautious in their operations. As it was, they were already standing on a loose thread as they could be busted for racketeering charges, let alone drug charges. The Mafia bosses knew that drug trafficking, especially on an international scale, presented even greater risks. Governments and law enforcement agencies worldwide had recognized the devastating impact of drug cartels and organized crime syndicates. They had formed international alliances to combat these criminal networks, sharing intelligence, pooling resources, and coordinating efforts to disrupt drug trafficking operations. This transnational cooperation made it much harder for the Mafia to operate with impunity. Extradition treaties between countries meant that if a Mafia boss was apprehended in a foreign nation, they could be extradited to their home country or other nations where they were wanted for criminal activities. This presented a significant legal barrier to their involvement in the drug trade. Valachi's betrayal coupled with Escobar's constant evasion of law enforcement, followed by his eventual downfall at the hands of the Cali cartel and the DEA, demonstrated the dangers and risks involved in the drug trade, and that was an example of what the Mafia bosses didn't want to be. The destruction of the Escobar family name, especially with how they were treated like fugitives in several countries after Pablo's death, served as a stark reminder that engaging in drug trafficking could lead to the destruction of their families and organizations. Despite their notorious reputation, the Mafia bosses held family values in high regard. Their wives played integral roles within the Mafia, responsible for training and instilling Mafia values in their children. They were the confidants of the bosses, trusted with sensitive information, and held the keys to secret locations where the mafias stashed their ill-gotten wealth. The bosses knew that involving their families in drug trafficking would expose them to significant dangers and scrutiny from law enforcement. They were determined to protect their loved ones from the risks associated with the drug trade and maintained a strict prohibition on involvement in narcotics family ties. It was a sad thing to admit, but despite having a no-drug policy, the mafias still had to deal with underlings and family members who dealt drugs. The outcome of these people was a warning sign saying beware to any who cared to pay attention to it. Anthony J. Rampino, also known as Tony Roach, was an American mobster associated with the Gambino crime family. It was said that he was never inducted into the family, yet he did the dirty jobs for them. He was involved in truck hijacking and drug trafficking. Rampino earned his nickname due to his physical resemblance to a cockroach and his heavy marijuana use. He had connections with prominent mob figures such as John Gotti and was known for his stickball skills and thieving abilities. Despite battling a severe heroin addiction in the 1960s, he successfully overcame the habit by 1979, but not without ratting out the secrets of the Gambino family, which he received a 25-year sentence for being in possession of and selling heroin in 1987. He played a backup role in the assassination of Paul Castellano and Tommy Bellotti, clearing the way for Gotti's leadership. His death was a result of prolonged drug use from experiencing heart and respiratory problems. It seemed like that was all, until the Colombo family also had to face their own fears. Sonny Franzese had just begun to face sentencing when his son Johnny found drugs, and the disaster began. John Franzese Jr., the son of notorious mobster Sonny Franzese, had always been proud of his ability to steer clear of the drug scene. However, fate took an unexpected turn one night in the early 80s when he found himself in a Manhattan strip club, consumed by a cocktail of alcohol and reckless at 23 years old, John was driving a luxurious cream Cadillac Biarritz, living a life of excess. It was during this fateful night that a friend offered him a line of cocaine, an offer he drunkenly accepted. At that moment, his perspective shifted, and he succumbed to the allure of drugs. The initial dose of cocaine provided an exhilarating rush, and John found himself trapped in its grip for the next six months. He was deeply involved in his father's loan sharking operations, but his addiction led him down a dangerous path of extortion and drug peddling. Money became secondary as he spent every last cent on cocaine, indulging in extravagant nights at the Waldorf, lavish clothing, and the company of high-end escorts. Michael, John's older brother who also told the story, attempted to intervene, urging him to break free from the destructive cycle. But John refused to heed his brother's advice, fueled by his addiction and insatiable cravings. Even Sonny, his father and a prominent figure in the mob, hoped John would embrace the mafia lifestyle and achieve maid status within the family. But who would trust the mouth of 
of an addict not to cause some foul play, Michael, recognizing the severity of John's situation, desperately tried to convey to their father the gravity of the situation. You don't understand what's happening with our brother, he pleaded. However, their argument became inconsequential when Michael himself landed in federal prison in 1986, facing a lengthy sentence and substantial restitution fees for his involvement in a gas bootlegging scheme. This gave room for John's drug-related troubles to escalate. He engaged in heroin dealing and even resorted to robbing other drug dealers, putting himself in grave danger and the Colombo family as well. On one occasion, a drug dealer retaliated and fired shots at him. Tragically, in 1990, John received a devastating call from his younger sister Gia, who was feeling unwell. Blinded by his drug-fueled lifestyle, he callously dismissed her pleas for help. Tragically, Gia succumbed to a fatal cocaine overdose shortly after their conversation. It was at this point that Sonny had an epiphany. He had asked John to take care of a problem, a thinly veiled request to eliminate someone in their line of work. However, instead of fulfilling this task, John prioritized his addiction, snubbing his father's orders, something unheard of in a mafia setting and punishable by death. Sonny, furious and profoundly disappointed, confronted John, expressing his embarrassment and disappointment in his son's inability to fulfill such a crucial demand. As a consequence of his choices, the Columbos, the crime family with which they were associated, decided to sever ties with John. They sent him to a deserted private club, intending to eliminate him once and for all. However, fate intervened when one of John's cousins unexpectedly walked into the club. Sensing the imminent danger, the cousin rescued John, delivering a stern warning. Your father won't be able to protect you anymore. It's over. Stay away from us. Thus began a downward spiral that lasted for years, a period marked by homelessness, debauchery, and distorted reality. The toll of years spent shooting cocaine and sharing needles became apparent on John's body, adorned with rainbow-colored bruises. He contracted HIV, and his life took a turn for the worse. Donning garbage bags as makeshift shoes, he wandered aimlessly along Queens Boulevard, fixated on phone booths that he saw as portals connecting him to his shattered family and fractured friendships. He was running mad. John resorted to desperate measures, resorting to petty crimes, smoking discarded cigarettes, and even engaging in prostitution, all in a desperate attempt to finance his insatiable craving for another hit of crack cocaine. In 1995, John found himself behind bars for possessing an unlicensed firearm. After spending nine months in jail, he returned home to find an unexpected message on his answering machine from FBI agent Rob Lewicki, known for his open investigation of Sonny Francese, John's father. The relationship between the Franceses and Lewicki had always been a peculiar mix of mutual professionalism. Sonny, aware of their roles as hoodlums and law enforcement, warned John that any consequences would be his own. Lewicki regularly reached out to members of the Francese family, including John, with the intention of seeking informants. Each time they politely declined and hung up, fiercely loyal to Sonny, who held significant power within the Colombo family as its underboss. The position came with unofficial control over the family's affairs, as the top spot had been volatile due to internal power struggles known as the Third Colombo War, in which lives were lost, arrests were made, and innocent bystanders were caught in the crossfire. However, Lewicki's persistence with John had a purpose. John was a desperate individual with no allies and nothing to lose. Their shared background as North Shore locals, growing up in the same area, attending the same schools, and having similar experiences, created a unique connection. Lewicki believed it was essential for John to hear him out and offered him a monthly stipend, emphasizing the benefits of having a friend in the FBI. For John, the pivotal moment came when Lewicki suggested that his cooperation could potentially protect his parents from legal trouble. Sonny frequently faced imprisonment due to parole violations, and John's mother, Tina, was suspected of credit card fraud. Although John's motives may have been complex, he ultimately agreed, but not without concerns about his father's welfare. John sought reassurance that his father would be safe from further jail time. Lewicki clarified that Sonny wouldn't be the primary target. Instead, the focus was on the Columbos as a whole. While John provided information about his father's conversations, Lewicki promised to shield him from direct questions about Sonny. Their collaboration began, and John divulged intricate details about the family's operations and various scams. Their relationship developed into a strange kind of friendship, founded on the condition that John remained drug-free. Lewicki made it clear that if any evidence of drug use emerged, their arrangement would immediately cease. And Johnny went to court to testify against Sonny, something that no mafian with true respect for the Omerta would have done but because of his drug habits. It was such a disappointment to his family and the Colombo family. He had to change his name to Matt Mazzarelli and remain incognito, or they'd have gotten him. Even the almighty mafia was not spared from the effects of drugs on people, families, and oath. And that was just extra motivation for them to take a stance you wouldn't expect them to take. A stance against drugs. 
The war on drugs. The war against drug trafficking has been an ongoing battle for as long as we can remember. So when the Justice Department made a stunning announcement revealing charges against several high-ranking members of the notorious Sinaloa cartel, it didn't come as much of a surprise. This transnational drug trafficking organization, headquartered in Sinaloa, Mexico, has long been a major player in the global drug trade, causing havoc and destruction in its wake. And the fight's not just in the U.S. In Mexico, authorities have been fighting against these cartels for over a decade, but they haven't had much success. The conflict has resulted in the deaths of thousands of Mexicans every year, including politicians, students, and journalists. Since 2006, when the government declared war on the cartels, the country has experienced more than 360,000 homicides. When it came to drug production, most of the heroin and methamphetamine came from Mexican suppliers, while cocaine was primarily produced in Colombia and then transported to the United States by Mexican criminal organizations. Over the years, these cartels have grown, split apart, formed new alliances, and fought against each other for control of different territories. The Sinaloa cartel is particularly powerful, with a presence in almost half of Mexico's states, especially along the Pacific coast, the northwest, and the country's southern and northern borders. They also operate in around 50 countries, making them the most internationally active Mexican cartel. Their former leader, Guzman, was extradited to the U.S. in 2017 and is now serving a life sentence. It's now led by Ismael Zambada Garcia and El Chapo sons, known as Los Chapitos. Another significant cartel is the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, or the CJNG, which is one of the fastest growing cartels in Mexico. They operate in more than two-thirds of the country and are known for their willingness to engage in violent confrontations with authorities and rival cartels. U.S. officials estimate that CJNG supplies more than one-third of the U.S. drug market. But how did we get to this point? Because you see, it's not just cartels that have a hand in this drug epidemic. Opiates, like morphine, have always been used to alleviate pain, and it's only natural that patients undergoing surgery or dealing with severe pain would seek relief from these medications. However, due to their addictive nature, these drugs were traditionally tightly controlled to prevent misuse and addiction. That all changed in the 1990s when researchers at a pharmaceutical company, Purdue Pharma, saw an opportunity. They began to push the idea that opioid pain medication was actually much less addictive than previously believed. This misleading information led to a dangerous shift in prescribing practices as doctors were convinced that these medications were safe and had minimal risk of addiction. The motive behind this push was clear. There were billions of dollars to be made from the sale of these potent pain medications. Pharmaceutical companies dispatched sales representatives across the United States and Canada, aggressively marketing these opioids to doctors and downplaying their addictive potential. They had deceived doctors and patients by presenting a fraudulent description of the drug as being less addictive than other opioids. The profit motive of the pharmaceutical industry was clear clearly prioritized over the well-being of patients. However, that's just one part of the opioid crisis. For decades, the most commonly used illegal opioid was heroin. However, according to the CDC, by the end of the 2010-S, heroin use and overdose deaths involving the drug appeared to be declining. The opioid crisis took on a new dimension with the emergence of fentanyl, a synthetic opioid that is approximately 50 times more potent than heroin. This powerful drug quickly became the driving force behind the escalating drug crisis. Interestingly, drug dealers had been using fentanyl analogs as an adulterant in illicit drug supplies since 1979, primarily in specific cities. However, in recent years, fentanyl has spread across America, fueling the worst drug crisis in the history of the United States. It's the leading cause of fatal overdoses in the country. While the opioid problem initially started with the overprescription of legal pain medications, it has intensified in recent years due to the influx of cheap heroin and synthetic opioids, including fentanyl, supplied by foreign drug cartels. Notably, the Sinaloa Cartel and the Jalisco New Generation Cartel have established extensive distribution networks, and some cartels even rely on American citizens to smuggle fentanyl across the border. Shockingly, between 2017 and 2021, 86% of fentanyl traffickers were American citizens, emphasizing the complexity of the crisis and the involvement of domestic actors. Operating as a network of drug traffickers and money launderers, the Sinaloa Cartel obtained precursor chemicals, predominantly from China, for the manufacturing manufacturing which took place in Mexico, with the drugs then smuggled into the United States. The cartel was responsible for collecting, laundering, and transferring the proceeds from drug trafficking. Initially led by El Chapo and his son, Ismael Zambada Garcia, the Sinaloa cartel saw the Chapitos rise to prominence following their father's arrest. The Chapitos established a network of couriers, tunnels, and stash houses throughout Mexico and the United States to further their drug trafficking activities. These networks enabled the importation of drugs into the United States.
states, perpetuating the devastating fentanyl crisis. The magnitude of this crisis has become a significant burden on the economy, and the modern epidemic of fentanyl adulteration is far-reaching, impacting various geographic regions, increasing production, and leading to a significant number of deaths. More people have lost their lives to drug overdoses, with more than 64% of these deaths involving synthetic opioids like fentanyl and its analogs. In addition to the devastating impact of the pandemic, the growing availability of illicit fentanyl, often disguised by drug cartels as other types of prescription opioids like OxyContin, has worsened the crisis. In 2022, the DEA reported seizing more than 50 million fentanyl-laced fake prescription pills, a staggering increase compared to the previous year. Alarmingly, over half of these counterfeit pills contained potentially lethal amounts of fentanyl, underscoring the danger associated with these illicit products. Furthermore, the emergence of the dark web, an encrypted and anonymous section of the internet infamous for criminal activity, has facilitated the sale of fentanyl and other opioids. These drugs are often shipped through traditional delivery services, including the U.S. Postal Service, exploiting loopholes and challenges in monitoring and intercepting such illegal shipments. Fentanyl, due to its high potency, is not only sold as a standalone drug, but also used as an adulterant. Its potency allows dealers to traffic smaller quantities while still providing the desired drug effects that buyers expect. Manufacturers may also add bulking agents like flour or baking soda to increase the supply without incurring additional costs. Consequently, it is much more profitable for drug dealers to dilute a kilogram of fentanyl compared to a kilogram of heroin. Despite the evidence supporting various measures to combat the crisis, including harm reduction strategies and public awareness campaigns, implementation is often hindered by local politics and funding priorities. Consequently, many communities struggle to adopt these life-saving interventions, prolonging the devastating effects of the opioid crisis. Even today, the remnants of the mafia are involved in the drug trade. Whether it's protecting mafia associates who are selling drugs themselves, loaning money at interest to enterprising drug dealers, laundering money for drug dealers, or even robbing drug dealers who have no alliances, and thus protection, the mafia views the drug business as yet another financially lucrative enterprise from which they can become wealthy. They are unlikely to directly sell drugs. However, the Sicilian Mafia, which interacts with the American group which evolved from it, has direct ties to the drug trade, including the importation and sales of heroin from sources in Southwest Asia. The war on drugs is something that the mafias thought they could deal with, but they eventually succumbed. And their story is perhaps the perfect representation of the outcome of this drug epidemic. Forbes writer Art Caden put it best into words when he said, after almost 60 years of fighting, it's clear that the war on drugs is almost over and drugs have won. Don't believe him? Click a video on your screen right now and you'll be thoroughly